today we are doing um, screen printing here at Snap Studios in Edmonton. And today for our first layer, we are going to be doing um, a transparent silver layer on top of a digital print that Snap has printed for me of an image that I am currently working with. So this is etch. This is it before it's printed on. And today we are printing on top of digital. So screen printing as a whole is usually done on a metal frame with a polyester mesh. Yeah, your mesh count is usually um, indicative to what kind of process or what kind of outcome you're doing. So when people are printing t-shirts, this is usually how most of your graphic t-shirts are being printed. Um, you're usually using, using a mesh that's like a 110. So meaning it meshes wider, so more ink gets pushed through. Whereas here today I am using a 255 mesh, which is finer, and it allows for more detail, um, which is exactly what I'm looking for. We are, oh, we're only gonna print one layer today or right now that is a transparent silver that we are then going to apply an embossing powder by em, embossing powder by flocking it on the wet ink and then hitting it with a heat gun, which will create a chemical reaction on top, allowing for it to make a glossy top coat. The process of screen printing, like I said, is done on this metal frame. Today I am using um, photo emulsion that has been scoop coated onto the screen and I've taken a stencil. We have two stencils here. These are the action ones we're using today. Um, this is the first one we're gonna use. And what we're doing is we are exposing this to the screen. Anything that is black is blocked from the light and anything that is not is exposed to the light. And what ends up happening is the photo emulsion blocks the light in these black areas. So when you wash it out, these areas wash, wash away. This area does not. And then ink gets pushed through the areas that are black. So that's what we're doing today. So as you can already see, I've got my ink applied to the screen. I'm just gonna push it up here and I've got this piece of acetate that also has my image applied. So before we started filming today, I printed the image on the acetate and this is what we call registration. Registration is a way that we allow our layers to line up. So when you're printing multiple colors, you use registration to make sure those layers line up and stack on top of each other. So I'm gonna take this here. I'm gonna just push it under and I am going to find where it's supposed to sit on the image. The benefit to my image today is I'm not looking for anything super tight in registration, meaning the layers don't have to line up perfectly or completely. Um, if you are looking for that, you can use something called crop marks. Um, you can either use, it's like a rosette with a cross in the middle where you see CMYK. Um, to speed up our process today, CMYK is something that I usually do. And CMYK stands for cyan, yellow, magenta, and key. And key equals black. So any printed matter that you consume in your day-to-day -day life, it could be magazines, it could be newsprint um, or newspapers, it could be graphic novels, any of this, they're printed in CMYK. Um, when those layers lay, uh, layer up, that's how you're creating your mass tones. But today we're just, instead of actually printing CMYK, we are using a digital image, printing on top of that with multiple layers, which is something that you can also do. Usually in printmaking, a lot of people assume that you have to do hand-drawn or it's illustration-based, but the nice thing is printmaking is so malleable in different ways that working digitally is totally fine. It works great. Um, I think most printmakers or most artists nowadays who are working in print media are using um, some aspect of digital in their work, whether it's hand-drawn, but they're drawing it digitally. It could also be photo images that you've altered in Photoshop or another photo editing program. 
could also mean that um, drawing on top of digital image, it's, there's no right way about it. There's, it's so flexible that you could really do anything. The nice thing is a lot of people think printmaking is really traditional static, but in reality, experimental printmaking is honestly what makes it fun. So today, like I said, we're gonna be pulling these silver prints. So what I've done is I've lined up my image underneath, and now what I'm going to do is I've got my squeegee, which you can see already has ink on it, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically lobster claw it or screen hand it on either end. I'm going to extend myself over top and make sure I have this ribbon of ink here that I'm pushing back and forth. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna push down, 45 degree angle, I'm gonna pull towards me. I benefit because I'm tall, so I can get that leverage over top of my screen, but if you may not be as tall as I am, using a stool to get that leverage is totally fine as well. And then once you've printed that, you're gonna lift, and then you're gonna flood. So what a flood is, is you're pushing that ink back into those areas that you just pushed ink onto your paper to. So now what I've done is I've brought over my print that is still wet, and this is the embossing powder. So right now you can see it's a, a white powder that is going on top of the wet image. And I'm just gonna let it sit there for a few seconds, give it a shake, then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of tilt my paper and I'm just gonna let it flow back into this container. Now with that, we've got the heat gun here. And the heat gun, safety first of course. When you turn it on, you don't wanna be putting your hand in front of it. This can burn you pretty severely. Um, and when you're using a heat gun, especially on paper, you always want to keep it moving. And the reason why is if you're doing an addition or you're making art with it and if you leave it in an area too long, it will start to scorch and burn, which unless that's the look you're going for, number one, if that is, make sure you're being safe. Number two, um, yeah. So then you turn it on and then it's just a matter of moving back and forth and keeping it moving over top until I can see that embossment powder change to um, its gloss. It will take a few seconds. basically it for that layer. The benefit of this is you can see now before a lot of the time printmaking can be really quite flat um, and screen printing a lot of the time could be really flat just because it is usually an acrylic based ink that printmakers are working for. If you are printing on t-shirts you're usually using something called plastisol but here we're using an acrylic based ink. So with that, everything kind of sits on top of the paper. But when we use something like embossing powder or we're flocking our wet ink with anything, whether it's glitter, really could be anything, we're creating um, a print that becomes more tactile. Um, a little bit more maybe fun to interact with when it's hanging on the wall because as breaking light hits it, you kind of catch a glimpse of some gloss. So, now that we've finished doing the embossing powder in the first layer of our like light gray silver, we are now gonna move on to a different part of the image, which is going to be images of some pill capsules. So now that we've finished here, we're now gonna be printing elsewhere on the print. And this time, instead of it being one layer and adding something that makes the print tactile, we are going to add a bottom layer and then we're actually going to print a black layer on top, which is going to make the image that we are about to print more three-dimensional. So in the same way, we have our screen with the photo emulsion and our image exposed. And in the same way we did with the other one, 
We're gonna flip our screen up, flip our acetate over, and we're just gonna make sure things line up. So on our acetate, you can see that I have the old image of the can tabs here. And the reason why I kept those there are gonna be my registration marks. So I'm gonna make sure those areas that I've already printed line up perfectly with those can tabs, which means all everything else on this image will line up perfectly. So how I do this is I basically lean over and I use one hand to navigate the piece of paper underneath. And all I'm doing here is looking back and forth, making sure everything's lined up. scooching paper as I need here, here, there and then here I'm double checking my acetate so before these and these weren't really all that important you'll see here I have three strips of tape with three lines drawn on them and what that is used for is to make sure my acetate is lying completely flat and I know it's lying completely flat when those lines line up to the piece of tape that is on the table. So once we're here, I'm double checking. Again, I'm gonna push this back, bring this down, and it's the same process all over again. So again, I'm going to do a small ribbon of ink. Take your squeegee, leverage over top. Make sure you pushing down 45 degree angle and you pull. You lift. I'm actually gonna pull it again. Again, double pulling doubles your color, which gives you more opacity. If you're looking for more opacity into your screen ink and you're not really getting there, um, adding white pigment or white paint is always going to be helpful as titanium white always adds opacity. So here we can see that we have added these little bits of yellow, which will eventually have a layer on top, which will be a black outline. This is the screen exposure unit. This is what we're going to actually expose our screens on. It is a set of UV lights where you place your screen inside of the machine. You set your light units and you allow those light units to expose your screen with your image area in contact with your screen. You're then going to pick how many light units you want to expose your screen for. Um, light units aren't necessarily seconds, it's how much light you're actually exposing your photo emulsion. We are doing 40 light units and the reason why is because it is a digital transparency, meaning that I digitally drew it. We printed it out digitally so I know that that transparency is very opaque so we can expose it at a higher um, set of light units just because we know that it's really opaque. So 40 light units for this, we basically close the light exposure unit, we lock it, make sure, we start that vacuum, make sure it's suctioned, and you turn it on. You let it expose, and once you take it out, you let the vacuum release, unlock it, lift it, and you bring it into your uh, washout booth. And your washout booth can be used with a pressure washer. Today we're just gonna use um, just a hose and some water and some light sponging and you apply water, let it sit and you lightly sponge both sides, sides once they've both been exposed to water. Um, your image will almost immediately show up. You want to make sure you get that emulsion out of your image area and once you feel that you've got it out, take, take a look in the light, make sure it's washed out properly and you let it dry. Once it's dry, you're ready to print. So this was screen printing um, here at Snap Print Shop here in Edmonton. 
Um, if you have something similar in your city, I definitely recommend maybe picking it up or taking a class. But if you do not, or if you are currently isolating or staying home and being safe, here is a way to print at home. This is cyanotype printmaking at home. This is the at-home cyanotype uh, demo that we are going to be doing today. Right now, I currently have a flat lay of things you may or may not need. There are things you can sub out. There are things that you cannot. Um, things you definitely are going to need are your cyanotype part A and part B. Um, a container as, long, as well as a measuring device so you have equal parts a way in which to apply the cyanotype part A and part B. I'm choosing to use a foam brush. You can use a paintbrush, whatever you have at home. Um, a towel, a water basin, which I have to the side here, which I'll pull on screen once we actually get to that part and we do the exposing. Um, and two things of plexi or um, glass and this is for squeezing your images or your things that you were exposing to your cyanotype to um, keep it in the most intimate contact with the paper as possible. Um, I've chosen to bring in both so I've got some puzzle pieces and some string. I've got some can tabs and I've printed out some uh, transparencies, some negatives. Uh, when making your negatives, like disposable film, you want to make sure your image is inverted. You can see here that it's inverted backwards, so when it actually exposes, you get what the image should look like. You can just do that on any editing software that you can find for free, or if you pay for Photoshop or you can do it in Procreate, whatever works for you. And then I just use a solar fast film from Jacquard. Any inkjet or toner ink, uh, acetate film will work at your home computer, depending on the kind of ink you have. And you just print it out on here, let it dry for a day, and then you can cut it out so you can expose it to your paper. So here I have also got my paper and I've already taken some out and cut them in half. Best kind of paper to use is going to be something that can take water that's not going to break down and dissolve in water and something that's a little bit thicker and substantial. The reason why is we do have to submerge the entire sheet of paper in water to create um, the reaction with the water once it's exposed. So what we're going to do first is I'm going to move things along Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to move things along. Um, we don't need the towel because the towel is for when we are rinsing our prints. I'm going to move this along because I've already printed my transparencies. I don't need this as of right now because we are going to be applying our part A and part B to our paper, which then has to dry in a dark place um, as it cannot be exposed to UV or light while it dries or, or else it will expose. These are just the sheets that you can see I've got two of them here that I will sandwich together um, and that's going to create the most intimate contact. Move this aside. <laughs> So here I have <clears throat> half a tablespoon and a container to put my part A and part B. Now, part A and part B, half a tablespoon is actually pretty generous. You, if you're only doing a few prints, like I, I'm doing, I'm gonna paint with six here, half a tablespoon of each is more than plenty. You don't need much more. If any, you probably need less. Um, the part A and part B, you can get at most local art stores. Um, I got mine at Desserts, and I know most cities or larger cities, especially heading east, 
um, have them, but check your local art store and see if they have it available. Best way to use it is you dissolve, you put water in here. They've, it's got powder and you put water in it and you let it sit, you shake it up, you let it sit for 24 hours and that <clears throat> gives you your best um, quality mix. The, you can use it right out of the bottle, but it might not expose properly. Um, so you can see there, I just swirled it. I've got a little bit here in my container and I'm just gonna take a foam brush. And I'm gonna start painting these pieces of paper with some of the cyanotype part A and part B. Um, right after you paint them, you want to be putting them in a dark space, dark, cool space. Um, when I did this the first time, I put them in my laundry room and just closed the door and shut off the light. Um, today, I have actually got plan chests here where I'm just going to slip them in and let them dry in there. They take about 10 minutes to dry. Nothing too serious. And then when you're ready and they're fully dry, that's when you can do the exposing. So right now, I'm just kind of getting my foam brush saturated now you can cover the entire sheet or you can kind of do painterly gestural brush stroke i prefer the look of a gestural brush stroke so like Once that's painted on, it's that simple. You can see I've kind of got a yellow look to it, but once it's dry, it'll be ready to expose. So now that it's wet, I'm just gonna step back and stick it in somewhere cool and dry. And I'm gonna do that six times. And once you're finished with your coating of your paper, this can now just be rinsed away or washed away as you can't put it back in the bottle because you now have mixed part A and part B. Um, when you do coat your paper, <clears throat> it takes up to 10 minutes to fully dry, but um, that uh, part A and part B mixture on paper is stable for about four hours. So if you end up coating, leaving, and coming back later, you have about four hours to come back and do the exposure. Unfortunately, it's not stable much longer than that. So you wanna make sure that you're doing this all in one day. So now, as this dries, I'm gonna put that aside. We don't need this. <clears throat> Now, I'm going to prep where we actually get our transparencies ready. So this time we're going to do two at a time, but this time we're going to do one with a negative and one with objects that aren't a negative. So I'm going to take out my paper. place my image down on one and I've just got like puzzle pieces, string, the benefit of it a day where it's not as sunny, you definitely have more time to kind of work and
we're going to take a lot of the time too people will use things such as like plant matter um, dry plants work beautifully but anything that you can basically squeeze between two sheets of plexi work great so same process we're just gonna clamp these together to make our most intimate contact Now we let it sit. This one I'm going to let sit for, we'll say two hours as we let it change. All right, so now we've let this sit for a few hours. Due to not enough sunlight and as you can see I have now changed but now we're going to see how the exposure went so we're going to remove the clips remove the top and already you can see that we've got some of our exposure. Now what we're going to do is we're going to set it. We're going to start to rinse. We're going to kind of agitate it. We're going to keep track of the puzzle pieces so we don't lose them. This one you can see that the exposure was kind of blurry in spots due to not making intimate contact with our, our um, plexi and that was just because of the thickness of the items I picked. Um, anything flat laying like any greenery, um, leaves, florals, fauna, not fauna, any leaves, florals, and um, anything from outside that will be pressed nicely will work wonderfully. So now, taking that out after we've rinsed it sufficiently, we're just gonna give it a dab off. The nice thing too is a lot of the items I'm using, like the string would be fine, the negatives would work as well. The benefit is, is these things can also be used in screen printing. So when you do print them out, you do have the advantage of multi-use. Now, now this one might be a little overexposed. But I guess we're going to find out.
and again we're just blotting that off nicely to make sure that everything is cleaned off and now I'm moving my transparencies aside just making sure that we have room for these to dry so now this I would say is three hours of exposure with a low UV light, an overcast day. And in terms of like the original picture, it comes out pretty decent. Um, that looks a lot like the original photograph. The benefit of cyanotype too is now as I let these sit and dry, Over the next 24 hours, they become darker in color. So that Prussian blue then starts to become darker. So here I have finished one. Here's one of the same image. And you can see how different they are in color. This one comes out, is going to come, it's going to deepen that Prussian blue to, um, it almost tends to get more of a hint of purple. Whereas like right now it's pretty true blue. And here we can start to see that they start to darken. This one has an overexposure. This one I did earlier in the demo just to show you guys what an overexposure will look like when you don't expose for a long enough time during um, an overcast day. When it comes to exposure times, it's going to be hit or miss, especially when you're using um, just the sun through a window, especially if you can do it outside, it'll always work better. Um, but on a really hot day, what will happen is these will expose in less than 10 minutes, whereas today's took about three hours. So this one here was from a sunny day that is a 10 minute exposure on a really hot day. This is an hour exposure on an overcast day, and that's the same image. So stuff like this matters, and depending on the outcome you're looking for, depending on what you want to do with them after, some people like to tint a cyanotype, some people like to uh, print on top of a cyanotype, or some people just really enjoy these on their own. Um, putting them in a frame, they kind of look vintage, um, and beautiful and especially when you're using found object they can be quite stunning in like a picture frame but um, yeah depending on what you want to do with them after will depend on your exposure time the nice thing is is your materials are inexpensive your cyanotype bottles the a and b cost about twenty dollars and everything else other than the solar film so all together if you have the paper at home for your cyanotype chemical and everything else, total cost is maybe $30. Um, and you get some beautiful prints in the end. So have fun, experiment. It's inexpensive. On the bottles, it says that this set contains enough chemistry to make approximately 65 eight by 10 prints on paper or on paper or 50 eight by 10 prints on fabric. So depending on your application, of course, with fabric, you're not gonna get as many prints because fabric is much more porous and you're not gonna be able to pull as many, but experiment, see what you like, see what you don't. Um, some people also will spritz them with water and you'll get this kind of wet cyanotype look here. Looks a little bit more vintage and worn. But other than that, feel free to experiment and have fun. <laughs>